So uh, some of the things I say today, I'm afraid, may be a little repetitive, but I'll try to skip over those and just hit the highlights. And I titled this Conquering Neuroblastoma, which is our wish. And I'm afraid we're not there yet, but uh, that, that's our goal in the New Approaches to Neuroblastoma Therapy Consortium. And I know it's a goal that we all share. So our particular goal in this consortium is to develop new treatments for high-risk neuroblastoma, but specifically using mechanisms of action uh, designed to overcome resistance and, of course, decrease side effects and improve survival eventually. So the NANT started, it's a little bit different than some of the other groups we've heard about today. It's part of what's called a program project grant which is a collaborative grant funded by the National Cancer Institute, and it's called Biology and Therapy of High-Risk Neuroblastoma, led by Bob Seeger in Los Angeles. I'm the leader of one project called the NANT, and the medical director is Araz Marichelian, and the reason we're all working together is there are three laboratory projects developing, finding new targets in the lab, and developing new therapies, which then we hope to take into patients. And we have actually treated more than 500 children with uh, neuroblastoma since we started. And we started with eight participating sites and have expanded, sometimes contracted a little as sites couldn't participate, but we now have 14 sites around the U.S. shown with these stars. We also have a special site, so for example, Australia's helped us to start a trial, including DFMO, in collaboration with Mike Hogarty at CHOP. And they are a special NAND site for that protocol and are patients on that study and are helping with the science uh, of that study. Uh, Pat Reynolds in Texas is a special NAND member who's helped with the fenretinide studies. And MD Anderson is collaborating with, with us for the NK studies. We really reach out to anyone who has a great idea and data to support it for a trial that can be done in children. And we hope soon that we will be collaborating with the UK on this vaccine trial and possibly other trials. So we're gonna talk a little bit about who, when, and why for a NANT trial and how to select a trial. And then I'm going to hit the highlights of some of our open NANT trials. And try not to take too much time so we can all get to dinner and our discussion. So what are the options if they've relapsed? Well, I think we've talked about that a lot. It's to use available active chemotherapy the patient hasn't seen. Uh, it's to go on a phase two clinical trial um, with agents usually that have been more explored in children or showed some hint of activity, or a phase one trial, which is mostly what we do in NANT, or palliative care to treat children for comfort if they are not in condition to get anything more intensive or are not interested. So when would you consider a NANT trial? Well, <clears throat> certainly if you are a patient with relapse disease or progressive disease. We also uh, take patients who have what we call refractory disease, which is disease that's had less than a partial response to frontline induction therapy, as these are very difficult patients to treat. I think in the future, we are beginning to think about taking patients with minimal residual disease who we know are going to relapse. So patients with minimal residual disease in their bone marrow or by MIBG uh, are probably going to relapse if they still have this after high-dose therapy and transplant or a completion of whatever their frontline therapy is. We do not place a limit on prior therapies in NANT, um, although there are a few treatments that are excluded for safety reasons. <clears throat> so how do you decide which protocol is appropriate? First of all, some of our protocols are high dose or <coughs> cause significant suppression of the blood counts, such as our MIBG protocols. And so for those, we require that the patient either be able to harvest more peripheral blood stem cells or have some that were frozen and are in reserve for them. If it's an MIBG study, obviously they need an MIBG avid tumor. That's one of the ways of looking at the patient's target. Uh, another thing we've heard about is some of the immunotherapies seem to work better on 
small amounts of tumor or tumor in bone and bone marrow rather than bulky disease. So in making a decision, you want to see where the patient's disease is, or as Shaquille talked about, is it in the brain? Uh, you have to make sure there's or adequate organ function for whatever agent you are going to use. And then the patient choice is, of course, very important. Uh, is this an oral agent, a pill they can't swallow, or is it a liquid? Is it an inpatient therapy? Is it an IV therapy? Do they need to travel a long way for the treatment? And finally, unfortunately, limiting for phase one trials, which are usually for safety and dose escalation, we only treat three to six patients at a time, and then we have to wait one or two months till all the data is back to make sure it's safe to go to a higher dose. So we have to make sure there's an opening on the particular study of interest. And then what we've been hearing about so much today, which is why I highlighted it, is does the tumor have an appropriate target for the therapy? Well, that's very easy to understand with MIBG. Uh, is it taken up on a scan? But unfortunately, for all the other targets we've discussed, there's not a simple scan. And in fact, as you heard from Giselle and others, the interpretation of molecular data on the tumor is often not simple or clear. So uh, we really don't know what, what, how to predict response by the molecular targets. And that's due to heterogeneity when the sample was analyzed. Uh, is it something to do with the tumor microenvironment protecting the tumor? Some of the immune cells actually protect the tumor instead of attacking it. Uh, or are there agents available to target that molecular aberration? Or is it something the patient will have for a week and then their tumor will be sneaky and find a way around it? So the molecular targets and pathways are important and we're learning a lot more about them, but I don't think we're at the end of that story yet. Then also, uh, in interpreting your results, you have to know what the natural history of neuroblastoma is. One of the parents was just sharing with me a uh, story about her grandchild who was told he had six months to live and now is out many, many years later with neuroblastoma. So some of these refractory patients will have stable disease for a very long time. So it's hard to always interpret by progression-free survival uh, what the agent is doing. And we have to look at patients who've relapsed differently than patients who have refractory disease when we interpret the results of our trial. So we just looked at all the patients at UCSF, where I'm from, who had MIBG therapy. We looked at 200 patients who were treated with various protocols and classified them as relapse, patients who'd had a relapse or a progression of their disease before the treatment, or patients who were simply refractory to treatment who never went into partial remission. And what was interesting, we found that both types of patients responded equally to therapy, but the survival was much longer for the patients with refractory disease. So depending on what endpoint you choose for your trial will affect how you interpret the results of that. So <clears throat> we, too, are undertaking a precision medicine trial, which I won't belabor. It's very similar to many you've heard about. I think one of the differences, we're also looking at targets in the microenvironment, uh, gene panels reflecting in, uh, inflammation around the tumor to see if we can target those. And we will be definitely obtaining relapse samples and then comparing those to their original tumor. And also actually taking these tumors and getting them to grow in mice so that we can look at tumors immediately derived from patients and see how they respond to agents. Um, so I'd like to spend the majority of the time now talking about our trials uh, that we're doing in the NANT, uh, trying to test the rational use of agents targeting key molecules or the tumor microenvironment. And we have focused, rather than on single agents, which are probably better tested in a larger consortium where you're just testing one drug in many diseases for toxicity, we focus more on combinations of targeted therapy or combinations of targeted therapy with chemotherapy or with 
radiotherapy in the form of I-131 MIBG. Uh, and we are also very interested in immunotherapy, as many are in these days. These are just a sample of some of the trials we've completed in NANT in the last three years, uh, looking at combinations. We've looked at uh, several trials of combinations with radiosensitizers. Where, where is the dot? I can't see it. I see it on my hand, but not on the screen, so sorry. <laughs> Uh, we have looked at uh, fenretinide with very extensive uh, pharmacokinetics to show how we can improve absorption of this agent, and we've seen responses. We've looked at MIBG combined with transplant uh, and other combination of uh, targeted therapies like varinostat and Accutane. Uh, <clears throat> and our open studies, uh, which are listed here, and I'm going to talk about in more detail, are an immunotherapy study with uh, lenalidomide to stimulate NK cells, uh, CH1418 anti-GD2 antibody and Accutane, a study of an Aurora kinase inhibitor with chemotherapy, a randomized trial of MIBG, another DFMO study, and a study of serafinib with chemotherapy. So we also have uh, several protocols in development, some of which I will talk about. So this is just to, to pretend I know molecular biology. This is <laughs> to show you the pathways for NMIC, which is amplified in 40% of children with high-risk neuroblastoma. And this shows kind of the whole NMIC pathway, which can be simulated by receptor tyrosine. Thanks, that's better. Thank you, Daniel. Receptor tyrosine kinases on the cell surface, shown here, stimulate PI3 kinase inhibitor, uh, PI3 kinase, and we are testing PI3 kinase inhibitors. This also goes to the mTOR AKT pathway, and all of these lead down uh, to NMIC. So by using inhibitors along the way, we can inhibit MIC N stabilization and get rid of it and inhibit proliferation of the cells. And we're also looking at aurora kinase inhibitors because aurora kinase A also uh, acts to stabilize MCN. So by inhibiting it, we can get rid of the MCN. That's the theory. We'll find out in practice if it works. So one of our protocols is to test an aurora kinase inhibitor from Millennium called MLNA237, and the new name is now Alicertib because all these molecules have names. And this is combined on the basis of preclinical data from Yael Mosse at CHOP with Arinotecan and Temidar. So each of these lines is a mouse tumor, and you can see with the chemotherapy, the tumors continue to grow in 10 mice. With the MLN, the Aurora kinase inhibitor, they continue to grow, though not quite as fast. Uh, the control tumors, of course, grow, but with the combination, you can completely suppress growth of these neuroblastoma in the mice. So a phase one study of this drug alone was completed in the children's oncology group, finding the tolerable dose. And we then in NANT have combined it with chemotherapy. And we have just completed a phase one dose escalation where we give the five days of arinotecan and temidar and we give the Millennium Aurora kinase inhibitor for seven days. And <clears throat> initially, we only had available a tablet, so children had to be able to swallow tablets, which kind of limited it to kids over six in general. Um, and there are many medicines you can't take with this. But the trial actually went very well. The toxicities of this drug are actually somewhat similar to chemotherapy. It does cause lowering of the blood counts, which is why we used it with a rinotecan, which has less effect on the white blood count. And it also can cause some diarrhea from the rinotecan. And so after the first uh, level, we had patients with what we call dose-limiting toxicity from diarrhea and dehydration and prolonged lowering of the white blood count. But we didn't give up. We then said, you have to take an antibiotic to prevent the diarrhea, and you have to have Neupogen or GCSF to help prevent the neutropenia. And with that, we were able to escalate uh, 
two levels, though at the second level, again, we found that it was really too toxic. So this level in blue is the maximum tolerated dose of the uh, Millennium compound. And we are now, um, we saw some, again, we, I think we went over the toxicities. We did see anti-tumor activity. We actually saw quite a few responses at the maximum tolerated dose. And you can see, for example, if five patients got two cycles, you can see a patient each got three cycles, four cycles, five cycles, which tells you how long they were stable. Several patients had six and seven cycles. Five patients actually got eight cycles. And some patients are still being treated and have had as many as 23 cycles of this therapy. Um, <clears throat> so our next step with this is we have a phase two expansion cohort and we are also in infants, in fact, we've already completed the first dose level, evaluating an oral solution of this drug. So uh, we've shown that this is tolerable. You have to give a lower dose than the tablet because it's absorbed more quickly, and we already have our pharmacokinetic results. And we'll, we, of course, in all our studies, are going back to the laboratory to see if we're hitting the target. We're looking <coughs> at the cells in the patient to see if this drug is inhibiting the aurora kinase, and we are also looking at how much aurora kinase expression they had in their tumors when we started, and we are looking at uh, the pharmacogenomics, which means looking at the DNA the patient has to see if they are going to metabolize this drug rapidly or not. So the, the next drug, and I'm not going to dwell on this because we've heard a very extensive description from Giselle, and we met this morning, uh, several of us, to discuss this, but we are looking at DFMO as another indirect way to target MCN amplified tumors. And this is based on, of course, the preclinical data, uh, data on expression, high expression being bad, of the ornithine decarboxylase, and then data from Mike Hogarty showing that when you combine the DFMO with cytoxan shown in the dotted line, the mice with tumors survive much better than when you just give DFMO alone. So we have an ongoing trial <coughs> combining topotecan and cytoxan, which has known activity in neuroblastoma, with escalating doses of DFMO. And Again, as we said this morning, we don't know if higher doses are better with DFMO, but it's quite non-toxic, and we have escalated. Uh, we're now at 4,500 uh, milligram per meter squared at the current dose level. And this is a five-day cycle of the cyclotopo. They get three weeks of the DFMO, and then they get celecoxib, which is another uh, NSAID, which pre prevents the uh, uh, gets rid of the polyamines. So we're inhibiting them in, in two different ways. Is that the dose for remission? That's not for remission. This is for patients. Unless I say otherwise, all the trials I'm showing are for patients with evaluable disease. So either MIBG positive or disease in their bone marrow uh, so, or disease measurable on CT. So this is quite a different trial than, than the lower dose uh, DFMO alone that we were hearing about. And you wouldn't really want to give topocyclo for too long for someone in remission because it's fairly myelosuppressive. So our newest study, which hasn't opened yet, but uh, has our, the IND has been submitted to the FDA, is with a new inhibitor of, called SF1126, and this is based on uh, a drug that actually Luke Chesler studied when he was at UCSF, uh, but they made it into a more patient-friendly drug, and it inhibits both PI3 kinase and mTOR, so two different parts of that pathway leading to MCN. And in addition, it's actually linked to a RGD peptide, which is something that targets the integrins, which are part of the microenvironment of high-risk neuroblastoma. So um, we are going to be giving this drug, which in preclinical studies, again, you can see the usual picture of tumor volumes in mice not treated and tumor volumes in mice treated with this drug. 
Unfortunately, it's always easier to cure mice than to cure children, but at least it gives us our first indication. So uh, this study should open soon. The downside of this inhibitor, the upside is it's a dual inhibitor, uh, so there's less chance of the tumor escaping. And unfortunately, there are some adult oral inhib dual inhibitors, but be for various reasons, the drug company has not been willing to release those for pediatric use and is not yet definitely carrying them forward. So we're using this, which has to be given IV, but it's an outpatient drug. It's very easy to give. And it's been quite non-toxic so far in the adult studies. So it'll be given twice a week IV for as long as it's working. And again, for patients who have disease. So now we're going to move on to immunotherapy. And we are approaching this in a slightly different way than what you heard from Sloan Kettering and some of the others. We are trying to activate the patient's own natural killer cells, which are a kind of lymphocyte that can attack the tumor and that have been shown to work very well with the anti-GD2 antibody. So we're going back to the mice. This is an experiment from Bob Seeger's lab. And this is the name of one of the human neuroblastoma cell lines which has something fluorescent attached so you can see it grow in the mice. And when you give this with mononuclear cells, which would include NK cells, it doesn't have much effect on the tumor growth. But when you add a drug that's used for some adult uh, hematologic diseases called lenalidomide, it does diminish growth of this tumor in the mice. And when you add it with antibody and mononuclear cells, again, it diminishes growth. And when you combine with this tumor the mononuclear cells, human mononuclear cells, the lenalidomide, which is an oral drug, and the CH1418 anti-GD2 antibody, you almost ablate the tumors in these otherwise immunodeficient mice. You've given them immunity with the human cells you infuse <coughs> and the antibody. So um, this has been started in patients. We're at our third dose level. And initially on this study, we only accepted patients with disease, but now are amending it to accept patients in second remission since it's an immunotherapy and it expected to work on minimal residual disease. And the patients start with seven days of lenalidomide, which had, has already been tested as a single drug again in children for dosing and toxicity. Then we continue the lenalidomide, add the antibody, and uh, then on the third week we add the Accutane because we are trying to model this for treatment of minimal residual disease as we do it now in children after transplant. And we think, and it certainly seems like on this protocol, that the lenalidomide is going to be much less toxic than the IL-2, which we've heard a lot about today, and the GMCSF. <clears throat> So the next study, back to the mice, that we're going to pursue with this is to actually add in the patient's own natural killer cells, but to activate them. And this is first, again, a mouse study uh, done in co collaboration with the folks from MD Anderson and Bob Seeger's lab. Again, the mouse tumors grow violently if not treated. If you take natural killer cells which have been activated and grown in the test tube, and then uh, in, you freeze them, and then when you're ready, you thaw them and inject them into the mice, you get some uh, lowering of the tumor. If you do it with the antibody, you get much more. And if you actually culture the cells longer and inject it with the antibody, you can almost get rid of all the tumors in the mice. So, our study, uh, which is not yet open because this is a little more complicated to go through the FDA and the IND application for these cells uh, is being submitted this month. But <clears throat> what will happen is the patients will agree to go on. They will actually, they don't have to be Faris, they just send a sample of their peripheral blood. And this is expanded in the laboratory and grown and stimulated and frozen and then when the patient is ready, it is shipped back and infused uh, with lenalidomide and antibody, 
we're giving the cells and lenalidomide alone the first course and then the second course adding the antibody because we need to assess the toxicity, the side effects of this separately. So we're very excited about this. Um, again, I think the idea is that we stimulate these NK cells so that they will have a good immune response to the tumor. And this can be repeated uh, a second time or even a third and fourth if the patient has enough NK cells. And the the next trial that's directed again more at the microenvironment is a trial using serafinib. And serafinib is another tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which has pretty broad action. It inhibits tyrosine kinases on the cell surface and inside the cell. And it also inhibits the monocytes and macrophages which are associated with the tumor and which actually protect the tumor sometimes from the body's immune system. And it inhibits multiple uh, signaling pathways within the cell with STAT3, mTOR, and AKT. That could be another way of saying we don't really know how this works, but it does work <laughs> in the laboratory. And again, we've got our mice with their fluorescent tumors. Uh, here they are treated with cytoxan and topotecan, one of our standard chemotherapies, which doesn't do too much to cure the mice, but when we add the serafinib, we get a much better, though not a perfect, result. And you can see the uh, survival of the mice shown in this bottom curve. The blue curve shows them treated with the chemotherapy and serafinib. The red curve where they all eventually die is with cyclotopo alone, and this is a control. So that study has just opened. We haven't yet treated anyone, but we are ready. That really just opened a, a week ago. So I'm going to spend a little time now on uh, what's been my interest since uh, the late 1980s, which is using a known target on the neuroblastoma cells, uh, which take up MIBG. So metiodobenzoguanidine is very close in structure to norepinephrine, which is made, it's our fight or flight hormone made by our adrenal glands and the sympathetic nervous system. And since neuroblastoma is derived from sympathetic neural crest cells, most neuroblastoma is about 90% will take up MIBG, mostly through the norepinephrine transporter on the surface of the cells. And it's a very, very nice agent. Uh, this is a child at diagnosis of stage four neuroblastoma with a big primary tumor, and it lights up all the bone metastases very well and very clearly. And so that's why we decided we could treat with very high doses of radioactive iodine attached to the MIBG. And we originally at UCSF, we did a phase one dose escalation. We showed we could increase to much higher doses of this agent by giving back the patient their stem cells if their blood counts dropped. And that made feasible a number of other studies. And so in the NANT, we did um, several studies with high dose chemotherapy to simulate adding MIBG to transplant. We did the uh, phase one dose escalation with CEM chemotherapy and MIBG all given at the same time, and we completed a phase two study of 40 patients uh, with this treatment. And we also showed that we could give higher doses when support with stem cells was given in a non-transplant setting um, on the NANT 2001 study where we gave the MIBG two weeks apart. And we showed that no carrier added, a much more concentrated form of MIBG was safe and effective. And this is a, just a little side story. This was a compound uh, from a small company that wanted to get it approved and then went bankrupt. And I'm actually very excited because this compound has finally been taken over by another company who is planning to proceed to get FDA approval, we hope, for this agent. Um, we don't know if it's more effective than the standard preparation. That will have to be tested, but it's certainly safe, and it certainly see a similar response rate in our phase one study. So most recently, we've been interested in how we can make MIBG even more effective, 
and we have looked at adding uh, radio sensitizers to this agent to increase the effect of the tumor radiation. So one of the studies we did um, preclinical testing for at UCSF is to add a drug called varinostat to MIBG. Varinostat is a histone deacetylase inhibitor, which is a medicine that changes the expression of many, many genes in your cells. Um, <clears throat> and it was interesting because it had already been tested for a pediatric dose. And it, it was shown in the laboratory by other groups to have activity against neuroblastoma, both in the test tube and in the mice with tumors. And we did studies uh, showing that it sensitized neuroblastoma cells to radiation. And what was really interesting along the way of doing those studies, we found out that the varinostat increased expression of the norepinephrine transporter, which takes up MIBG. And we looked at MIBG uptake in cells and found in two different neuroblastoma cell lines a significant increase in MIBG uptake with varinostat at concentrations similar to that which we achieve in the plasma of patients with this drug. So we were very excited and we did an experiment in the mice with radiation and varinostat and the blue line is control, the red line is patients, to, uh, patients mice, tumors <laughs> treated with radiation. Uh, the yellow line, they're treated with the varinostat, but in the green, it's the combination, and we were able to suppress tumor growth. So we've just completed a phase one study uh, in which we escalated the varinostat and the MIBG. Uh, we give the varinostat for two days before the MIBG and then continue it for a total of two weeks, give the MIBG on the third day because we want those genes upregulated, and then it's supposed to sensitize the cells to radiation. And then we gave them their stem cells back just as an infusion so that they didn't have a prolonged lowering of the blood counts and infection. And we were able to get all the way back up to our highest tolerated dose that we generally give of MIBG of 18 millicuries per kilo. And we saw a very nice response uh, to the MIBG positive lesions to this treatment. Our other study, which we published using a radio sensitizer, was to add a rinotecan, which is a known radio sensitizer for many tumors. Uh, and has been used in rhabdomyosarcoma. That's one of the other pediatric tumors where this has been active. And for this, we used uh, in this study the traditional uh, five days a week for two weeks, along with a dose of incristin, and gave the MIBG on the second day. And then again, we supported with stem cells at the higher dose levels. And we found, again, that uh, we had a 28% response rate, which is, you, it's hard to compare in these very small studies to the response of MIBG alone, which is usually around 30 to 35%, but at least it was no worse. Uh, we saw the expected toxicities, some diarrhea from the arenotecan, one patient who had hallucinations, which was probably attributed to their um, <coughs> Ativan. <laughs> And they all engrafted very promptly, so this did not hinder engraftment actually in either of those two studies. So how do we choose? What, what are we doing next? And people said to me, you keep coming up with new combinations with MIBG, and, and where is it going? So we decided we needed to do a randomized trial. So we have uh, an ongoing phase two randomized trial. Uh, all the patients get 18 per kilo of MIBG, and they are randomized to either get MIBG alone, to get MIBG with vincristin or rinotecan, or to get MIBG with varinostat. And the outcome is going to be uh, which um, regimen has the best response, and secondarily is does one of the regimens have unacceptable toxicity, which we're not expecting since we've already studied these to some extent. And patients are allowed to get a second round of treatment if their disease is stable or improved. Um, and we hope with about 100 patients that we will be able to say either they don't add anything other than maybe a little more toxicity or one regimen is getting a higher response rate. 
So I think we need more of these, and this is the same kind of study we've talked about doing with the vaccine for patients in remission. Does it really add anything? Somebody was asking, should all patients in remission be treated? You know, we just don't know the answer to that question. So the MIBG is actually, I'm really excited, has, first of all, the, our studies have stimulated uh, the centers so that we only had four MIBG centers when we started doing these NANT trials. Now every NANT center but one, so 13, <laughs> can treat with MIBG, and there are actually 15 places in the U.S. that have the lead line room facilities and expertise to do MIBG therapy. So this has uh, improved the feasibility of doing a national study, and Brian Weiss and I are co-chairing a children's oncology group study to treat patients up front. So patients with high-risk neuroblastoma uh, get the standard induction therapy that we've been using, and then at the end of induction, they get a course of MIBG, and then two months later, they get their high-dose therapy and transplant with Bumel. And this is first a pilot study, so it's not open at every center. It's open at 20 or 22 centers in the U.S. But if we show it's feasible and not too toxic, and we know there may be a little more toxicity because of the radiation from the MIBG and following with Bumel, but we hope the spacing will allow us to do this, then we will, are planning a randomized phase three trial in the children's oncology group, which we also hope will uh, spur the FDA to finally approve this agent, which has been in use in the clinic in thousands of children since the 1980s, and it's still not approved in the U.S. So we're, we're pretty excited about this, and we'll, it should be completed by the spring. One uh, last thing about MIBG we're exploring at UCSF is to find a more accurate way to say how much MIBG the patient should get, another kind of precision medicine. And it's been very challenging to do what we call dosimetry on patients, that is to estimate how much radiation each tumor will get from a certain amount of I-131 MIBG. And this has been very difficult in all tumors. And one of the limitations has been that um, the MIBG scans, standard scans, which are done just in nuclear medicine, even when they're combined with CT, are not very accurate for volume measurement. So we have uh, started a study with I-124 linked to MIBG, which is a positron emitter, and we are doing PET scans, PET CT scans, and we now actually have a PET MRI scanner, which we hope we can start doing. And th this has shown, this is the first patient we already published. This is just one patient, but we have an ongoing study. And you can see how clearly her sites of disease show up. On her standard I-123 scan, even with spec views, there were only three sites of disease. But with this technique, we saw an un undisuspected rib lesion. We saw lesions in her humerus, uh, lesions in the hip, and so on. <clears throat> And we were able to do quite, uh, we hope, accurate tumor dosimetry. I think we'll only know that when we do a large number of patients and correlate it with response to MIBG therapy. So uh, I know there's a similar study also beginning here in the UK, so I think it'll be very interesting to see the results of those. And finally, we're always looking for better ways to see who should be treated at the end of therapy. And uh, one of the studies we're doing is a different way to measure minimal residual disease in the bone marrow. Instead of looking at immunocytology or one or two genes by a technique called PCR, we are doing something called TACMAN Low Density Array, which is with five gene combination. And we're using it first. It's been used also in COG. We've applied it, but this is from our cohort of relapse patients in the NANT. And the patients who had undetectable uh, involvement of neuroblastoma by this very, very sensitive test never relapsed in this. This is just a one-year time. But we all know these are all patients who had prior relapse. Uh, the patients who had an intermediate level shown in red had a much higher relapse rate, but not all have relapsed. 
And the patients who had the highest expression by this array, uh, PCR, all died very rapidly in less than a year. So we are hoping to be able to use this to, again, stratify patients. If we want to look at patients in second remission, this will be a very useful test. And we think it will be useful as we refine it uh, for upfront patients at the end of therapy to see who actually still needs more treatment. So I will stop here and take questions. Uh, I think we are trying to personalize dosing with things like dosimetry and TLDA. We're trying to personalize specificity uh, to look at drivers of the tumor so that we can improve survival and decrease effects. And I think it's our team with you and the doctors and nurses and the scientists uh, it will take to beat this cancer.